Hi there. This is Reading Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, and this is Chapter 29, Part 1. I'm actually going to divide this chapter up into three sections. The first section is a lot of practical application and reflections on, you know, how, how having qualities the center of your reality is, can be very useful in terms of solving <laughs> some of the world's problems. It's also about loneliness, which is very interesting. So they have uh, been on the road for more or less two weeks now, and they examine all of their gear. You know, they unpack it and try to consolidate it and organize it and stuff. So everything's kind of beat up and dirty, and um, and something happens that always happens on a long trip. The soft metal tube of sunburn ointment has burst, leaving white crud all over the machete scabbard and a fragrant smell everywhere. The tube of ignition grease has burst too. What a mess. Is that not familiar? So Chris does laundry while uh, Robert goes and gets all the stuff they need, including another, another tube of greasy stuff and a tackle box to put all the, all the um, uh, liquids and greasy things in. I get everything but a chain guard. The parts man says they don't have one and don't expect to get one. I think about riding without a chain guard for what little time is left, but that will throw crud all over and could be dangerous. Also, I don't want to do things with that presumption that commits me to it. The presumption, of course, being that um, he doesn't need the chain guard because he's not going to have a motorcycle much longer. So obviously he seems, you know, to be getting a grip on himself, that, that he's amenable to leaving room for a better outcome. I mean, remember, he's thinking he and Chris will part ways, and he's being, he was being very melodramatic about it. So maybe he's, you know, reality is kind of... <laughs> A more reasonable way of looking at things is, is, is uh, coming into view. And since he hasn't been able to find a chain guard, he looks for a welder instead to, to uh, repair it. Down the street, I find a welder sign and enter. Cleanest welding place I've ever seen. Great high trees and deep grass line an open space in back, giving a kind of village smithy appearance. All the tools are hung up with care. Everything tidy, but no one is home. I'll come back later. So he does a bit of reflection and he notes um, here on the West Coast, there's so much traffic, but the cars are particularly well maintained. Um, remember the Dion Wallach song, uh, Do You Know the Way to San Jose? So in, L in that particular period of time when that song came out, which is right about this time, L.A. was already a great big freeway. They're not quite in California yet, by the way, but um, almost. And so they go to a restaurant for breakfast, and, and Chris reads out loud from a magazine called Motorcycle News, which probably still exists. The waitress looks at him a little curiously, then at me, and then at my cycle boots, then jots down our order. She goes back into the kitchen, comes out again, and looks at us. I guess she's paying so much attention to us because we're alone here. While we wait, she puts some coins in the jukebox, and when breakfast comes, waffles, syrup, and sausages, ah, we have music with it. Chris and I talk about what he sees in motorcycle news, and we are talking over the noise of the record at a relaxed way people talk, who have been many, uh, been many days on the road together, and out of the corner of my eye, I see that this is watched with a steady gaze. After a while, Chris is, has to ask me some questions a second time because that gaze kind of beats on me it's hard to think of what he's saying so that's interesting that the, the gaze is beating on him it's unsettling to him for some reason and Robert is funny because there's a real conflict for me in his personality on the one hand he's um he's this genius who can't it's not possible that he's going to have too many people to talk with on his level and you see what a hard time he's having connecting with Chris. And then there's this tendency, you know, you notice it with his friends, with the Deweeses, with the Sutherlands, to sit back and observe humanity like an anthropologist. But at the same time, you know, like the statement, the relaxed way people talk who have been many days on the road together, he he's has these, these 
observations, subjective observations of how it is, you know, how he is in relation to the person. And he's sensitive to people. So his brand of anthropology, let's just say, isn't exactly objective. He's a strange mix. As we leave and go out and start up the cycle, there she is in the door watching us, lonely. She probably doesn't understand that with a look like that, she isn't going to be lonely long. I kick the starter and gun the engine too hard, frustrated by something. And we ride for the welder again. It takes a while to snap out. So what's he frustrated by? Well, there's something in that gaze and what it means. Um, now look at... Look at the lonely people in the world. Loneliness is an interesting human experience because you can actually, in most cases, easily remedy it. Yet, people feel powerless to do so for a variety of factors. So let's look at the waitress, for example. It seems like the waitress feels like an outsider. She's curious about people around her and perhaps trying to connect with them in, in passive ways, like through the music. I think that was an attempt at connection. But she's introverted, she's shy, and, and uh, you know, or this is the way she seems, and that keeps her from, from connecting with people. They have to connect with her first. They have to make the first move. But like Robert says, there are plenty of people who would make the first move with her. And that can, for, um, for lonely people, be a problem in itself because you don't necessarily connect with the right people, and that's not necessarily going to alleviate your loneliness. The welder, on the other hand, is a different flavor of lonely. He's, he's kind of a jerk, and he keeps people away from him by being a jerk. So listen, listen to this guy. The welder is in, an old man in his 60s or 70s, and he looks at me disdainfully, a complete reversal from the waitress. I explain about the chain guard, and after a while he says, I'm not taking it off for you. You'll have to take it off. I do this and show it to him. He says, it's full of grease. I find a stick out in back under the spreading chestnut tree and scrape all the grease into a trash barrel. From a distance, he says, there's some solvent in that pan over there. I see the flat pan and get out the remaining grease with some leaves and solvent. So it turns out the guy's an amazing welder. He's really skilled. He's that type of skilled craftsperson that takes his time and then does it absolutely right. And he repairs the chain guard with a deftness that totally impresses Robert. But this tacit disdain continues for the whole repair job. He represents a, a, another kind of loneliness, the kind of loneliness who have a lot to offer to the world in terms of their skill or ability. But for whatever, whatever reason, they can't connect. And that skill should be a way of connecting with people. And in a little bit in this chapter, you're going to see how it can be. But... but the, this per person can't. He just, he has the skill, and um, but he can't connect with people because he's suspicious of humanity. No holes. You can hardly see the welt. That's beautiful, I say. One dollar, he says without smiling. Then I catch a funny quizzical look within his glance. Does he wonder if he's overcharged? No, something else. Lonely, the same as the waitress. Perhaps he thinks I'm bullshitting him. Who appreciates work like this anymore? So someone who's been burned and spurned and disappointed by people in life are also going to project that disappointment onto random strangers, onto their clients. Let's just say people like Robert um, are going to get the brunt of the lack of appreciation he feels. And, you know, that shitty thing that he did with making Robert clean the grease off, that's sort of like saying, well, I'm skilled and you're not. And that kind of goes with this package. Um you know, don't give me this thing like that. If I'm going to work on it, it, it better be clean, which is kind of not very good customer service. This kind of loneliness is a vicious circle. You get, um, so say you get mistreated or abused or you have a, a, a shitty childhood. Um, so then you become wary and suspicious as a defense. And through that suspicious behavior, you know, the way you act because you're suspicious of people, you have a negative attitude towards them. You know, your first, uh, your first sense of them is negativity, this projection. So you turn people off by the way you respond, by the way you respond to them. And then they respond to you negatively because you're not very nice to them. And that just justifies your belief that people suck. It's a, it's a terrible vicious circle. This really is a, you know, a wheel of samsara. 
And so this is another common manifestation of loneliness. And so Robert too and Phaedrus are a version of loneliness. Both are driven by, both, both possess this exceptional intelligence. And um, maybe that outsider stance of Robert is due to that. His tendency is, is, is his absolute tendency to, to analyze. He just has to do it because he's so smart and observe. Um, Phaedrus, of course, was lonely because his genius had allowed him to see through to the substrate of reality that no one else could see. And that, of course, is going to be very isolating. And it was throughout his entire college career until he was able to connect with his students with, quality, with the quality essays. But for most of his career, you know, it's alienating. It makes him fixated on one thing and just neglect everything around him, and uh, including his relationships big time. So maybe the, let's go back to Robert, maybe the frustration that Robert was feeling was an all too familiar identification with being an outsider, you know, this, this, what this woman is doing with her curiosity is exactly what Robert does with people. Sorry, I just had to add this. Another reason this gaze might be unsettling to Robert is because throughout this book, there's been a ghost observing him and vice versa. So after they leave the welder shop, they enter the redwood forest and, and soon cross over to California. Lonely people back in town. You catch it the first fraction of a glance from a new face, that searching look. Then it's gone. We see much more of this loneliness now. It's paradoxical that where people are the most closely crowded in the big coastal cities in the east and west, the loneliness is the greatest. Back where people are so spread out in, the, in western Oregon and Idaho and Montana and the Dakotas, you'd think the loneliness would have been greater, but we didn't see it so much. An explanation, I suppose, is that the physical distance between people has nothing to do with loneliness. It's, the, it's psychic distance. And in Montana and Idaho, the physical distances are big, but the psychic distances between people are small. Here, it's reversed. And this is an excellent observation because loneliness in general has little to do with physical distance. It's an internal phenomenon um, most of the time. And we've seen three variations of it. The shy outsider, uh, the person who's defended and suspicious and negative, and the person whose cognitive reality just can't be understood by most people. But Robert has a fourth explanation of loneliness of the the specific type of loneliness that happens in the city, and let's just say in a technological, a technologically advanced situation. And this is what, this is the one we see a lot of these days. It's the primary America we're in. It, it hit the night before last in Primeville Junction, and it's been with us ever since. There's this primary America of freeways and jet flights and TV and movie spectaculars, and people caught up in this primary America seem to go through huge portions of their lives without much consciousness of what's immediately around them. Isn't that the case? So this loneliness, uh, let's look at this from in terms of brain science. It's, it's a rupture in the ability con to connect. So basically it's that type of sustained attention to another person, to be in relation with them, you know, to talk for an hour or so, that becomes dull compared to the instant gratification of shiny internet objects. And that's a lot what's going on here. This is how he puts it. The media have convinced them that what's right around them is unimportant. And that's why they're lonely. You see it in their faces. First, the little flicker of searching. And then when they look at you, you're just kind of an object. You don't count. You're not what they're looking for. You're not on TV. Again, this is another example of why Piercing's work is so useful to us now. He's already saw how television, which pretty much has the same components of the virtual world, although even you know the virtual world is even is much faster. You know the, the attention span is even lower, and these TV shows and stuff they emulate life, but but more exciting and more attractive. So um, these lonely people he runs across in the cities not only have this problem, but they're so removed from nature. They're so, and the natural cycle of time, let's say, and the connection with nature. And they've been relieved of this, uh, of the necessity to interact with nature with the raw physical environment by progress. 
and that was the beginning of what we were really suffering from today. So you get addicted to instant gratification from television and now from, from the internet. And like I said, the, the neurochemistry, um, the neurochemistry makes it even more difficult for you to go into a mode where you need sustained attention. Um, this is a major problem that we're going through. And I would say, and I'm going to reiterate this, um, I'm also talking to myself, you know, in order to have a quality existence, you really are not, are going to have to figure out a way to get off the internet for a lot of the day as much as you can. But in the secondary America, we've been through of back roads and Chinaman's ditches and Appaloosa horses and sweeping mountain ranges and meditative plots and kids with pine cones and bumblebees and open sky above us mile after mile after mile. All through that, what was real, what was around us dominated. And so there wasn't much feeling of loneliness. That's the way it must have been 100 or 200 years ago. Hardly any people and hardly any no loneliness. I'm undoubtedly overgeneralizing, but if the proper qualifications were introduced, it would be true. Now, what's your thought about that? I know what mine is. Um, Secondary America seems to have vanished to a large extent. Uh, not completely, though. I live out in the country part of the week, and, a uh, and quite a bit of this attitude still exists, and quite a bit of big open spaces still exist. Uh, the, the, there's an attitude connected with the land and with the community. So churches are well attended here in the country, and clubs like the VFW and the Elks do just fine. Um, there is an infiltration of bad stuff. You know, there's large factory farms, uh, chicken farms, and there's a, a lot of GMO commercial stuff. And the Chesapeake Bay is slowly dying from glyphosate that the, that the farmers are using, and it's a tr and it's that's a big problem. Um, there is some degree of uh, problem from climate change, but I would say the direct problem here is the Roundup. And that is really screwing things up. And another thing, and this is this is happening a lot around the country, is that the the fauna from China, imported from China and all these all the, all these uh, container ships, you know, the area is riddled with invasive species. Um, not just that, but some you know some things have been brought here for certain reasons, like the snakehead fish, which you know decimate the, the local fish population. And we also have another thing, which are these reeds that they brought from the, you know, Asian uh, re uh, marsh reeds that are very invasive, that are all over now. But if you didn't know all this stuff, if you're just looking at the land and you're experiencing it, you can still feel that connection with the land here. And you can drive several miles here and not see a soul, but you don't feel lonely for exactly this reason he's talking about. If you're in nature, it's hard to feel lonely when you're surrounded by nature and the awe it still inspires. Technology is blamed for a lot of this loneliness since the loneliness is certainly associated with the newer technological devices, TV, jets, freeways, and so on. But I hope it's been made plain that the real evil isn't the objects of technology, but the tendency of technology to isolate people into lonely attitudes of objectivity. It's the objectivity, the dualistic way of looking at things, underlying technology that produces the evil. So how does this translate into how the, the virtual world has robbed us from connection, let's just say? Because the virtual world takes an objective stance as to what's good in life. So they'll, they'll extract out of life the tender romantic moments, you know, being at one's physical peak, monetary success, exciting, breathtaking experiences, and then, and then in a calculated, objective way, uh, people creating content, uh, media content, will say, this is what's good and life should be this, and this is what our virtual world is going to contain. So the people behind media are defining what people want and giving it to them and producing a rubric that, um, that, we, can then, that we then project into the real world, this messy, slow-moving world, and, um, and assess our life based on this. 
And this causes a lot of misrepresentation, simplifying things. If you want to talk about evil, um, you know, the buzzword is ideology for evil, um, for, for an evil way of looking at things. Very simplistic, very dualistic. If Here are the parts, and if we just get the parts to work, everything will be fine. And always it's a big disaster, and it, it often ends up being evil. A content is created, a media content is created by objectively assessing what people want in general, and then technology proceeds in the same way with an objective assessment of what's needed and a specific or what's wanted and a specific goal in mind. So technology is set up to be dualistic. Here's the problem, here's the goal, point A to point B. Quality works differently. It evolves. It's based on the last step and what is next. So you've got what, you, what is, you know, like say you're, say you're repairing the motorcycle. You get to a point where you have to stop, then you have to reassess where is the quality, then you get the quality, and then you move forward. And that's how quality works. It evolves. It's based on the last step, inspiration, and moving forward on the track of quality. It's not predetermined. There isn't a specific goal that you have to achieve. It's a mixture of what you know, the boxcars, and what presents itself to you, which is the pre-intellectual quality. And then how you manifest that quality with what you know. That's what you end up with. So it's a little hard to explain, but it's very different from dualistic. It's, it's an evolving thing that goes forward. So a technologist of today, or any time, might say, how do we get this thing made so it's the most profitable? Or how do we make this to fulfill some preconceived requirement or government specification? Um, a quality approach would be, here's a great idea. Where will it take us? And, 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 and let's do it right. And um, you actually do see this. Here's a great idea. Where will it take us? And let's make sure we're doing it right as it's taking us where it needs to be. Let's, let's make sure we're putting the best possible effort into this. And sometimes you do see this in technology. Any great innovation proceeds in this fashion. It proceeds on the quality track. But once it's established, it becomes mired in dualistic thinking, which I interpret as the need to be um, efficient, adequate, or profitable. But likely all three. And that is the preconceived dualistic notion and you can see how that is going to result in something that's not so good. So my takeaway from the gumption trap Chautauqua and thinking about this a lot is is that the stance of objectivity results in, in not being motivated by quality but by again what is adequate, what is efficient, and what is profitable. Now these three things aren't bad in themselves and maybe one a variation of these might be the highest quality decision at that time. Remember that the trip that, that Chris and, and, and Robert go on is the highest quality thing Robert could think of doing. It may not really ultimately be the best thing, but it's the best thing he could think of at that time. So it was adequate, but it was the highest quality decision. So I hope that makes sense. And sometimes things need to be profitable. The highest quality decision is to make sure things are profitable. You know, the highest quality decision you can make sometimes if your bills are due is to make some money. That's why I went to so much trouble to show how technology could be used to destroy the evil. A person who knows how to fix motorcycles with quality is less likely to run short of friends than one that doesn't. And they aren't going to see them as some kind of object either. Quality destroys objectivity every time. So this would be the mechanic, the mechanic who does things right and people respect him for it and want some of that. You could say the welder was kind of like that, but the trouble with the welder is, is he had this big psychological block. He didn't use the quality to interact and for his relationships to evolve. He used his skill as a block. And that's the sadness of loneliness. It's like the waitress who didn't realize that she had the capacity not to be lonely, but you know, without with being so passive, maybe the wrong people would come in. So unless you are flexible, and this is the, the what problem with the welder, it was that barrier, he won't let things in. Quality is a back and forth thing. You, quality informs you, you manifest it, and that manifestation informs more quality. The point here is you can't be objective when you're doing what you do with quality because that good is informing you. 
and, and back and forth. It's not what it's, what's expedient, what's adequate, or what's purely profitable. It's what is emerging. Maybe one of those things, but not necessarily. So you see how a goal, when you're working with quality, the goal, a strict goal isn't going to work. It needs to be kind of, you know, you're going in a direction. Uh, like Neil Gaiman said, the, the mountain in the, in the, uh, the distant mountain has to be fuzzy. And this attitude is beautifully expressed here as a way to overcome a major hurdle that nearly all of us face at one time or another. So someone working with quality takes whatever dull job he's stuck with, and they are all sooner or later dull. And just to keep himself amused, starts to look for options of quality and secretly pursues these options just for their own sake, thus making an art out of what he's doing. He's likely to discover that he becomes much more interested a much more interesting person, much less of an object to the people around him because his quality decisions change him too. And not only the job and him, but others too, because the quality tends to fan out like waves. The quality job he didn't think anyone was going to see is seen, and the person who sees it feels a little bit better because of it, and he's likely to pass on that feeling to others. And in that way, the quality tends to keep on going. So Jordan Peterson has a very similar component to his philosophy, and Peter's pragmatism, uh, by the way, and the meaning component that undergirds his theory makes him in a lot of ways very much like Peterson. So listen to this next, line, next bit and compare it with Peterson. My personal feeling is that this is how any further improvement of the world will be done, by individuals making quality decisions, and that's all. God, I don't want to have any more enthusiasms for big programs full of social planning, for big masses of people that leave individual quality out. That can be left alone for a while. There's a place for them, but they've got to be built on a foundation of quality within, within the individuals involved. And you could say the same thing about technology. I think it's about time to return to the rebuilding of this American resource, individual worth. There are political reactionaries who've been saying something like this for for years. I'm not one of them, but to the extent they're talking about real individual worth, and not just an excuse for giving more money to the rich, they're right. We do need to return to individual integrity, self-reliance, and old-fashioned gumption. In other words, the motivation, uh, the return needs to be motivated by the desire to connect with quality, not the manifestation of some political stance. But like I've said before, this is where Peter diverges from Piercig in recommending particular viewpoints and particular actions that are in the dualistic world. Like Piercig would say, let quality guide you to fix the motorcycle with care. No, or let quality guide you to do whatever you do with care and see where it takes you and make sure, you know, see that it's taking you on the quality track because you know what quality is. Peterson might say, I've done all this work and my conclusion is be responsible and be a good citizen. So that dualistic thinking in Peterson has been since his political evolution. Like I said before that, um, you really could use Peterson's work to uh, very usefully to understand Peirce's. There is a lot of parallel, um, which is why his earlier lectures before all that C-16 stuff are so much more valuable to me. Back then he would have said, let meaning shine forth, okay, you know, uh, that that sounds like um, quality will guide you. You know, you know what quality is. Meaning, a lot of lot of similarities, just like with Verveke's re relevance realization. Piercing says, acknowledge social patterns and use them, but don't get stuck there. Go forward. You know, and Peterson says. Some social patterns from the past are better than the ones we have now, and we need to dig them back up. So if any of you have read Lila, there's a certain amount of regal in Peterson of today. And this is why he's starting to be associated with the political side. Can you imagine, you know, Pearson really being on one political side or the other? You read through this book, you're going to see something, things that you could associate with the left and things you can associate with the right. The true visionaries are apolitical. I believe this, you know, and I mean, obviously not in the sense that if there's a fascist wave, they're, they're not going to be, they're not going to act. But when it comes to something like what's going on today, I believe that true visionaries are apolitical. And I think it would have done a lot better in the long run for Peterson to be more that way. But we now have uh, Pearson for that.
uh, Fiedrus went on a different path from the idea of individual personal quality decision, and I think it, it was a wrong one, but perhaps if I was in his circumstances, I would go this way too. He felt that the solution started with a new philosophy, or he saw it as even broader than that, a new spiritual rationality in which the ugliness and the loneliness and the spiritual blankness of dualistic technological reason would become illogical. Reason was no longer to be value-free. Reason was, be to, was to be subordinate logically to quality. And um, we've, we've already gone through the, uh, the updating, let's just say, of reason. So I'm not going to talk too much about that now. We've, we've talked about that in previous chapters. But what I do want to talk about is theory versus practice. And this is actually a big deal. To what extent do you need a philosophy? Do we need a quality metaphysics to be spelled out with diagrams? Or do we just need to connect with quality as much as we can and live our lives that way? Piercing's rationality is, can be subject-object when it needs to be, but it's ensconced in quality. And this, this is the pattern of everything. Um, finite subject-object uh, um, dynamics ensconced in a bigger non-dualistic reality. And this is the pattern of everything, if you're willing to see it. And that's the beauty of his theory. It mirrors the way things are. That's why quality is mistaken for Tao. So look at Jonathan Pajot. It's very similar. Science is nested in religion. And although that religion uh, in Pajot's framework. That religion manifests imagistically. And I think Pierce would go one more step down to the substrate, to the origin of those images. Behind quality, there can be God or not. Either way works. Anyway, in spiritual practice in general, unless we are truly mystics or truly scholars, we need a roadmap and a journey. And he was sure he would find the cause of it not being so back among the ancient Greeks whose mythos had endowed our culture with the tendency underlying all the evil of our technology, the tendency to do what is reasonable even though it isn't any good. That was the root of the whole thing right there. So today what would we consider reasonable? Again, it would be something efficient, something profitable, or something that's adequate. Um, all these things are reasonable. And you can already see the problem. It's very easy for something efficient or adequate, uh, something efficient not to be any good, something adequate usually isn't all that good. It tends to be you know, adequate. <laughs> and something that's profitable, um, you know, that can go either way. The, the very, very frequently things that are profitable are not any good if they're just there to be profitable, if they've just been created to be profitable. I said a long time ago that he was in pursuit of the ghost of reason. This is what I meant. Reason and quality had become separated in conflict with each other. And quality had been forced under and reason made supreme somewhere back then. And so what ended up happening is material objectivity became the center of our reality. Even much of the religious arguments um, has to do with whether or not does God exist as an actual object. So if quality is reality. What are the implications of this separation that went way back? Was it necessary to separate uh, so we could, you know, see the material world objectively for the progress that we needed to make to get ourselves in a position we are now? Um, and now we're coming back around and we need to take up the position of quality being the central reality again. Or would we have been better off with qualities the center of reality all along? So that can certainly be a, a topic of a major philosophical debate, I think. So they go down the road and they are hitting, or just about to hit the PCH, which is the Pacific Coast Highway that runs all the way down the west coast of the United States, along more or less along the uh, ocean. The road leads out of the tall forest now into open gray skies. Along the road are many billboards. Shenley's and the warm painted colors goes on forever, but one gets the feeling that Irma's gives tired, mediocre permanence because of the way the paint is cracking on her sign. So that remark about Irma's is amusing. I guess it's an advertising faux pas that any good cognitive science, science um, influenced advertiser, which is they all are now, you know, all that persuasion advertising, 
based on cognitive science these days. And um, one of those admin would easily point this out, that the emotional association is critical. You know, you, you're emotionally associated with the shoddiness. That she may be the best hairdresser in the world, but <laughs> you're never going to believe that because of the shoddy billboard. And then he said the billboard that goes on forever. I wonder if that's those sequential bill, billboards because that reminds me of something in my childhood of Stucky's billboards in the South and Stucky's sold ice cream and pecan logs. And they would have many sequential billboards um, all the way down to where the actual shop was. So as a kid driving down the road, my grandfather, every time he saw one of these signs, he'd shout out, Stucky's. And after six or seven of these, my grandmother would say, Oh, Barrington, quit yelling about that every time we pass one of those stucky signs. So the rest of this chapter is about searching for the ghost of reason and the prisoner of quality in ancient Greece. I'm probably going to divide that up into two more sections. So I hope that made sense, and I will see you next time for Chapter 29, Part 2.